Good morning and welcome to the San Francisco Interfaith Council's weekly online briefing for faith leaders. Today's program is to mask or not to mask in the new normal. A special thanks. The San Francisco Interfaith Council weekly online briefings are supported by a grant from MetaFund. Thank you. The important ongoing work of the San Francisco Interfaith Council would not be possible without generous funding from congregations, corporations, faith-based social service agencies, foundations, judicatories, and supporters like you. Help us spread the word. Visit sfinterfaithcouncil.org to learn about SFIC programming and how to become a supporter. Follow SFIC on Facebook and Twitter and subscribe to SFIC's YouTube channel to watch all of our virtual events. A bit of housekeeping. Today's program is being recorded. For audio and video, all participants are muted and without video to minimize distraction. To submit a question or comment, select the chat button at the bottom of your screen and send a message to Q&A John McKnight. Time permitting, we will answer participant questions during the program. For closed captions, select the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen and click enable live transcription. San Francisco is open. Thanks to San Francisco's successful COVID-19 vaccine rollout and decreasing COVID positive cases, the city is aligning with state guidance that removes nearly all local COVID related restrictions. You can protect yourself, your family and your community by getting vaccinated, staying home if you're sick and maximizing fresh air. So let's get vaccinated. Drop-ins for COVID-19 vaccines are now available citywide. No appointment needed. The Pfizer vaccine is available for ages 12 and up at San Francisco Zuckerberg General Hospital and Southeast Health Center. Moderna is available for those 18 and up at Maxine Hall. Go visit sf.gov forward slash get vaccinated to find all of our vaccine sites. Now is the time to come together San Francisco because together we can stop Asian discrimination, bias, hate, and violence. The COVID-19 virus has no race or nationality. It is simply a disease. To report a hate crime, call the SFPD at 415-553-1133. And at this time, I'd like to hand the floor over to the Executive Director of the San Francisco Interfaith Council, Michael Pappas. Michael, the floor is yours. Thank you, Trey. Good morning, I'm Michael Pappas, and on behalf of the San Francisco Interfaith Council, I wanna welcome you to this week's online briefing for faith leaders. The state of California fully reopened on June 15th, making the end, marking the end of social distancing, capacity restrictions, and mask requirements in almost all indoor and outdoor settings for vaccinated Californians. Wanting to be good role models for their children and respectful of those vulnerable, and also those who may not have yet been vaccinated, the end of the mask mandate has found a good number of people reticent to relinquish their masks until a greater sense of safety is engendered. This week's online briefing for faith leaders hosted by the San Francisco Interfaith Council will address the question of the day to mask or not to mask in the new normal. Whether you are a congregant, faith or religious institution leader, this presentation will provide the considerations necessary to make informed decisions regarding masking and creating and implementing mask policies. At this time, I wanna welcome the founder and past chair of the San Francisco Interfaith Council, Rita Simo, who will offer a welcome as well as read the interfaith statement that we read before every San Francisco Interfaith Council event. Rita, the floor is yours. Thank you, Michael. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. So glad you're with us. This is an interfaith community. Whatever our individual belief, it can be freely expressed here with no apologies. 
If we are invited to offer a prayer in this setting, it should be offered according to the tradition with which we identify. If we are invited to speak on a subject from the perspective of our tradition, we are free to do so without fear of offending a diff those who come from a different tradition. We come together as people of faith to learn from each other that we might better understand the multiplicity of the faith traditions in our city and in our world. Thank you and good morning. Thank you, Rita. At this time, we are very pleased to welcome Paige Hosking, a board member of the San Francisco Interfaith Council and a representative of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, who will ground us in a reflective moment. Paige. Thank you, Michael. Uh, and thank you, Rita, for uh, the opening statement as well. I always love hearing that. Um, as Michael asked me to give the reflective thought today, um, it took me a little bit to think about what I wanted to say, um, but I was reminded a few days ago um, of something that I kind of had just lost sight of or forgotten and uh, wanted to share that with you. So um, I thought it was fitting as well. As we've been asked to navigate this uh, uncertain, these uncertain times and make decisions for either our congregations or for work or personally, um, I found it's been easy to feel a little bit lost or overwhelmed, um, but was reminded that like we are people of faith. And even if you're not, um, you have opportunities to seek out faith and peace. And um, I was just reminded that God is among us. So I wanted to just share three of my favorite scriptures um, that kind of help, helped me remind me of this. So uh, the first is in Doctrine and Covenants 8863. Um, and it reads, draw near unto me, and I will draw near unto you. Seek me diligently, and you will find, find me. Ask, and you shall receive. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Um, and then in Proverbs 3, 5, it says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. And John 14, 18 says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. And I just thought, as we're seeking guidance and comfort in these times, um, keep doing so with faith and patience. And I know that as we open our hearts to God, no matter our circumstances, trials, sufferings, or mistakes, you can know that he lives, that he loves you, um, and that because of him, you are never alone, and that God is among us. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Paige, so very much. And I'd, I'd almost like to pick up on, on something that you started with, because I think one of the great roles that uh, communities of faith and faith leaders in particular are going to need to play in this new phase of the pandemic, as we emerge from the pandemic, is navigating people back to connectivity. Um, we've been isolated uh, for 16 months plus. Um, and, uh, and, it, and now we are having to re-socialize. And I think that uh, this, is going, this is going to be really uh, the great challenge Hafiz is gonna to have today uh, in speaking with us. Uh, having just recently gone to church for the first time, I went to uh, a, a, an Episcopalian church uh, on last Sunday. Um, and I noticed that uh, the requirement of the local bishop uh, Bishop Andrus, is that all people uh, be masked at services um, as well. Uh, this, is, this seems to be the case also coming from the archdiocese, the messaging from the archdiocese of California and all Catholic churches. Uh, so I, I raised this in my introduction of Hafisa Salabai, uh, who is no stranger to our um, briefings. Hafisa is uh, the Community Partners Group co-coordinator uh, for the COVID Command Center, and she is going to continue to liaise with the faith community and faith community leaders. She's done a stellar job with John McKnight uh, throughout the uh, pandemic. Hafisa, we welcome you. And with that, those sort of words of introduction, uh, I, I'm, I'm hoping that you can enlighten us and kind of give us a sense of what you're hearing and what we need to know regarding masking. Uh, I did want to, uh, in, in introducing you, I wanted to 
acknowledge and say a special thank you to my counterpart at the Marin Interfaith Council, Scott Quinn, who's invited uh, the clergy from Marin to join us as well today. Um, so you have a broader audience, um, but uh, we, we are so, so great, grateful for your presence here today. A feast of the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. And thank you, Michael, for the warm welcome. On June 15th, California marked the full reopening. This means that the color-coded tier system was retired and many restrictions were lifted. One would think that with many restrictions lifted, we would start seeing normalcy. But even then, there's always a personal choice that one should take into consideration. And that's your individual's health, the risk of the situation you're putting yourself in, and the health of the people you'll be in contact with afterwards. The end of the mask mandate has many people holding on to wearing their mask until they relinquish a sense of safety. Whether you are an individual on the street or an employer at a house of worship, this presentation will guide you in making the decision of when you should be masking. Please note that the language used in the following slides are pulled directly from guidances and that I will speak to these slides as it will apply to houses of worship. Before we begin, I, before we go into the face covering, I want to quickly go over what the current state and local guidance are that were released on June 15th. So San Francisco's Safer Return Together order went into effect on June 15th and will continue until amended and rescinded by the San Francisco Health Officer. Along with issuing this new order, many of the orders and directives relating to COVID-19, including your indoor worship, dining, and gathering directives will no longer apply. Though some others like school and youth programs will continue. The order is available online and I've also linked it to this presentation so that when Michael does share this presentation with you all, you can easily access it. Next, I will highlight the big changes that took into effect on June 15th, and we'll also speak on local and state guidances to help you plan on safely reopening your house of worship. The San Francisco Health Order now lifts local capacity and physical distancing requirements. This means that your house of worship may return to full capacity and social distancing is no longer required, but we do encourage unvaccinated individuals to continue to do so. This also means that you may sing individually or with a choir without distancing and masking. Additionally, businesses such as your house of worship are no longer required to prepare and post social distancing protocols. There are only two required signages and I will go over those in just a moment. And again, um, specific guidances under the local health directives no longer apply. However, if you plan on having Sunday school or other youth programs, there is still a directive applicable to that sector. And finally, businesses such as your house of worship are still required to report COVID-19 outbreaks in your workplace. So here are the two required signages now and are available to print online. There's one to remind individuals of COVID-19 prevention and best practices to reduce transmission. And the other signage is to be is required to be posted in employee break rooms or areas where employees can be encouraged to get vaccinated and informing them how to obtain additional information. So as you saw in these past couple slides, all restrictions are lifted, but we need to remind ourselves that COVID is still around. The new guidance is from the city, state, and CDC says people who are fully vaccinated against COVID-19 no longer need to wear a mask indoors or outdoors in most cases. But we realize that families with children who are not yet old enough for a vaccine and those who have family members that are at high risk may find it difficult to decide what's best for everyone. That's why we want to remind everyone that wearing a face covering adds protection. Fully vaccinated people who do not wear a face mask, but it's a good practice to cover your, mask, your mouth and nose with a mask when indoors and when you're with others who are from different households. While anyone may wear a mask for more protection, it is especially important for people who are not fully vaccinated to continue wearing masks. Although San Francisco has its own health order, we are now following the state's guidelines about face covering. 
So when we look at mass guidances, it needs to be thought of now in two directions. So one is you as an individual or the persons that show up at your houses of worship. And the other is when you have employees. And that's when the Cal OSHA guidance kicks in. And we'll go over that in just a moment. But first, I just want to mention that the end of mask mandate has many people holding on to wearing masks until there are sure signs that the pandemic is still behind us. Whether to be socially accepted or considerate of others, wearing a mask has become a habit that may be hard to break. I will no now go over the state guidances that is directed for patrons, the public, your congregants, or even for yourself when you're on the streets as a general public. So the public, your congregants, or your first self um, are not required to wear masks if they are fully vaccinated. However, the public is required to wear masks regardless of vaccination status under the following settings. On public transportation, so that's airplanes, ferries, buses, trains, ride shares, and in transportation hubs um, when you're waiting for your transportation. So bus terminal, train stations, ferry building, or any other area that provides trans transportation. Um, you must also wear a mask regardless of vaccination status in indoors when um, you're around K through 12 schools, childcare and other youth settings. In healthcare settings and long-term care facilities and at state and local correctional facilities and detention centers. And of course at homeless shelters, emergency shelters and cooling shelters. On the contrary, if the public, your congregants are unvaccinated, then masks are required in indoor public settings and businesses. These settings include your houses of worship, retail, restaurants, family entertainment centers, their meetings, any state or local government offices where, serve, where the public is being served. And you can of course remove your mask when actively eating or drinking when you're unvaccinated, but it is highly required that you continue wearing your mask if you're unvaccinated. So some guidance for youth programs, if you or your child is attending or either picking up or dropping off a child at an indoor childcare program, a Sunday school, community learning hub, or any other out of school time program, masks are required for all adults and children 24 months and older, regardless of vaccination status. However, physical distancing is still required when children are not wearing masks, especially during meals and naps. When outdoors, face masks are not required, but we encourage children to wear masks when in large crowds, especially when vaccination status is unknown. So in places like your houses of worship where masks are required for unvaccinated, you may choose to require all participating at your service, whether they are your congregants or your staff to wear masks. You may implement a vaccine verification to determine the requirement to wear a mask. And we'll go over that in just a moment or allow vaccinated individuals to self attest that they are in compliance prior to entry. Now, please note that the following individuals are exempt from wearing masks at all times. Persons younger than two years old, persons with medical condition or disability that prevents wearing a mask, persons who are hearing impaired, where the need to see the mouth is essential for communication, or for persons for whom wearing a mask would create a risk to the person related to the work. Now, many of you may have not thought about the Cal OSHA because you think of them as being involved in environmental hazard of workplace. What has changed since COVID is that we all now have an environmental hazard in our workplace. The guidances that you see now are managed by the city, are distilled now to the state, which is the Cal OSHA. You now have an environmental hazard in the workplace that must now be mitigated through vaccination and masking. I will not talk about masking from the standpoint as you as an employer, you as a workplace manager. What we use as personnel in our guidances, that term is not being used by Cal OSHA. Cal OSHA only uses the word employee. But I believe that this pertains to anybody that has a regular standing within your workplace, including your volunteers and your worship team. So let's go through this. As an employer in your workplace, if you are unvaccinated, 
face coverings are still required when you are working indoors at your workplace. Additionally, employers have to make respirators available to unvaccinated staff. Cal OSHA defines a respirator as an N95. I want you to make a note that although respirators are required to have available at workplaces, it is 100% for volunteer use. If unvaccinated individuals choose to wear any other type of face covering, they may choose to do so, but as an employer, you must have some available for volunteer use. And of course, some businesses may choose to require masks for all patrons and staff, regardless of vaccination status. So let's talk about fully vaccinated employees at your workplace. Fully vaccinated employees do not need to wear face coverings except for certain, certain situations during outbreaks and in settings where California Department of Public Health requires all persons to wear them. In the Cal OSHA guidelines, you will see that fully vaccinated do not need to wear a mask if they are fully vaccinated unless there is an outbreak. That's three or more employees with a COVID-19 positive test within a week or 20, and that's considered a major outbreak, then masks will be necessitated at your workplace again. It was just yesterday that the California Capitol reinstated mask mandate for all people inside the Capitol, regardless of vaccination status after an outbreak. And otherwise, the California Department of Public Health requires a mask in specialized settings. And we talked about a few of them, but one of the reasons I wanted to be aware about shelters is if you were to open a shelter or a cooling center or some other emergency center in your house of worship, the mask will be required by all regardless of vaccination status. Additionally, fully vaccinated do not need to be offered testing or excluded from work after close contact unless they have COVID-19 symptoms. Remember before when we used to say like, oh, I came in close contact with someone who tested positive for COVID and you would then need to isolate. Well, if you are a vaccinated person, then that no longer applies if you do not have any symptoms. And finally, fully vaccinated employees are allowed to wear a face covering without a fear of retaliation from employers. In this city, it's not much of a problem, but if you go to other counties, I've personally gotten weird looks for wearing a mask. So if your per workplace has unvaccinated employees, they may request a respirator for volunteer use from their employer. Again, Cal OSHA is requiring respirators like N95s to be offered to unvaccinated persons. The reason for this is because under CDC and federal OSHA guidance, unvaccinated persons are to wear face coverings and physically, physically distance indoors. Because California is phasing out of physical distancing, Cal OSHA is requiring voluntary respirators as it reduces the risk of infection better than physical distancing alone. Additionally, employees who are not fully vaccinated and have COVID-19 symptoms must be offered testing by their employer. So what does it mean by offering testing? It doesn't mean you have to te have testing available at your workplace, but instead you have to offer it by informing employees about how they can obtain testing. This could be through you as their employer, local health department, a health plan, or even at a community testing center. The only obligation for an employer, for all the employees, is to provide information and to ensure that an employee does not incur any costs. This, mean, this would mean to pay employees wages for their time while they're getting tested, as well as travel time to and from the testing site. So if, for example, if I was an employer, I would post on like the employee or staff bulletin board or share lists of nearby testing locations with my employees just for their convenience, even if it's not work related, at least they know where they can get tested. So what is your role as an employer? You as employer, the manager, may mandate vaccination for employees. I will send a couple of links to back up the statement. There are two aspects under the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission and the Department of Fair Employment and Housing that state that you may require vaccination for employees. You must provide face coverings to unvaccinated persons and make them available to vaccinated persons upon request. Most of us have plenty of masks, but if you permit unvaccinated employees to come in, then you must provide them with masks. Employers must offer testing after potential exposures. 
And as mentioned before, this is to offer time and provide information on where they can get tested. You don't have to physically provide the testing at your workplace. Additionally, um, you must ev evaluate ventilation systems. Ventilation is key to preventing COVID from building up in the air. And for many of that view, that can be windows and air purifiers or whatever ventilation measure works best for your workplace. Finally, employers must document the vaccination status for fully vaccinated employees if they do not wear face coverings indoors. So let's say you have offices and all employees want to unmask. You as an employer are required to have a log of vaccination status to back you up in the event you have an outbreak. So there are several ways you can collect that information. Um, employees can show the employer their CDC vaccination card that they received the time of their vaccination. They can take a picture of the vaccination card. A photo of the vaccination card can also be stored on an electro electronic device, including your phone or iPad, any other device, and that could be, could be shown that way. Um, employees can show a documentation of vaccination from a health provider, or they could even provide a written self-attestation of vaccination sign which is signed. And this would include like um, the date they got vaccinated, um, the name of the vaccine. So, um, and then, and it would just be basically just show that it was signed under penalty and perjury. Additionally, the state released a digital COVID-19 vaccine record portal. And this is very convenient. All you need to do for this one is you just need to enter your name, date of birth, your cell phone and email address, that you use when you received your vaccine and set a four digit pin to access your vaccine record. After submitting this information, you will get a link to a QR code, something similar to what I've shown here and a digital copy of your COVID-19 vaccination card. The benefit of this portal is that you can save the QR code as an image on your smartphone. And what I've done is I've created a special folder in my phone so I can easily just find it just by, I don't have to scroll through my camera roll. So then when you go to businesses or venues that require to show proof of vaccination, all you need to do is to show them and they can scan it instead of actually carrying your vaccination card. So now that we've covered what the guidances are for the public and the employer, let's take a look at how local businesses are implementing masking. Businesses are creating posting their own signs. As you can see, these three coffee shops have different requirements. On the left, Everyone entering the coffee shop are required to wear a mask regardless of vaccination status. It's not pictured here, but they also had a sign that if you don't have a mask, then they will sell you one. But you won't, you won't be able to get your coffee without a wearing mask. This one in the middle had a sign in multiple languages, making sure that all of their customers followed and understood the same requirements. On the right side, we have Starbucks saying that mask is optional for fully vaccinated. What I like about this sign is that they included a message at the bottom, like kind of like a fine print. It's hard to read here, but it said, thinking about getting vaccinated, learn more at, and then it's basically directing people where they can get more information about vaccinations. So maybe when you are posting signs at your house of worship, you can add a link or a QR code directing your attendees on how to book an appointment for vaccination, or maybe show um, pull up a map for the nearest vaccination sites. A few other signs that we saw um, that included messaging. Um, this one right here, um, right here says that if you're not feeling well, stay at home and stay safe. But the fine print here, I like this one too. We are more than happy to serve you online. So if you as a house of worship are still streaming your service online, maybe this is an approach you wanna take. You know, hey, you're welcome. But if you're not feeling well, you know, we still have the option of serving you online. And then of course, helping to keep your employees and your customers safe. And then we have this one right here from AT&T. Um, this one was um, nice too. It was just basically reminding people that fully, what fully vaccinated means. Um, it's basically saying the CDC defines fully COVID-19 vaccinated as two weeks past your final dose. So it's reminding people that they are considered fully vaccinated two weeks after, and that's when they can actually let go of their mask. So if you just took your, vaccination shot yesterday, you still need to wear a mask. It hasn't been two weeks, yet, have not been over yet. And then this one on the far right um, says, we are happy to take your order outside of the shop if you are unvaccinated and unable to wear a mask at this time. 
So if you at your house of worship are holding a food pantry, this might be something that could help. Um, this might be an approach that you want to take. You know, you could say if you're requiring masks, then if you're unable to enter the premises without a, and unable to wear a mask, then you may offer to take them outside the door and um, support them that way. So again, just kind of like a recap, um, the places where masks are required for everyone. Um, so regardless of vaccination status, face coverings are required when you are at homeless shelters, emergency shelters, and cooling centers. When you're seeking health care, and this includes in while you're waiting in the waiting room. When you're inside a K through 12 school child care facility, youth force or any other youth settings and at businesses or venues that choose to require masks for all patrons and staff. At work, if you are unvaccinated, face coverings are still required when you are working indoors at your workplace. And regardless of your vaccination status, face coverings are still required when you are on public transportation or waiting for it, or when you're driving or riding in a taxi or ride share, even if it's by yourself. So now to answer the million dollar question to mask or not to mask in the new normal, it's really your choice of ma uh, masking. It really just boils down to your own health, your personal tolerance for risk and the situation you're in. But it's a good idea to always carry a mask because people are also of course asked to comply with whatever local rules and businesses, any local rules or businesses um, that the workplace has established. So, if the workplace says that, hey, you're all required to do it, then go ahead and do it. But if you're just walking outside the street and you don't have a mask with you and you need to get a grocery store where it requires it, you won't be able to go in to get your groceries. So it's always best to just carry a mask. So that's all I have for you today. I wanna to thank you all for having me here today. And I hope this presentation was helpful and please reach out to me if you have any questions. Afisa, thank you so very much. This has been a comprehensive uh, presentation. And uh, for our viewers, I just wanted to reiterate that we will be sending the recording link as well as uh, links to the resources that uh, to which uh, Hafisa referred. Uh, we did ask uh, uh, San Francisco Interfaith Council board member and treasurer John McKnight who is also a member of the San Francisco VOAD, Volunteer Organizations Active in Disaster, and he has worked with Hafisa on the COVID Command Center uh, to, uh, to put some questions to you, Hafisa, uh, from some of our faith leaders that we have harvested over the course of the week. Uh, John, you know, you know I, I have a couple of questions as well. So uh, uh, we'll, time permitting, we will uh, get to all of these questions as well as any that you might put to Q&A today. John? The floor is yours. Thank you, Michael. And uh, thank you, Havisa, for the presentation today. From Michelle Miles Chambers of the Faith Senior Program, uh, the San Francisco Foundation, she asks, well, she states a bit that noting that California has had a slight increase in positive COVID-19 tests and hospitalizations. As the state has entered a no mask and more relaxed state with the virus and the Delta variant on the rise, what are the suggestions broadly on masking, social distancing, et cetera, when we're out and about. Thank you. So yeah, let's just quickly go and review what I basically just said. The new guidance from the city, the state, and CDCs says that people who are fully vaccinated against COVID-19, they no longer need to wear a mask indoors or outdoors in most cases. However, we did expect to see an increase after June 15th when restrictions were lifted and people are interacting more. But so far, our hospitalization rates are still quite low. My suggestion is to look at your surroundings. Are you around families with children who are not yet old enough um, for a vaccine? Or are you with family members um, who are at high risk? Even though masking and social distancing requirements are lifted, it is a good practice to wear a mask when indoors and when you're with others who are from a different household because it only adds protection. Thank you, Havisa. Mm -hmm. From the Metropolitan Eurasimos of the Greek Orthodox Metropolis of San Francisco, he asks, in light of the Delta variant, Dr. Fauci recently suggested he himself would wear a mask indoors if unvaccinated people were present. Going forward, at what rate of infection would our city health officer mandate going back to wearing masks indoors? 
So to answer, answer your question, um, we really do not know, um, but this is when you have to make choices. Like when you do not know about the vaccination status of those people around you. I was at an indoor event a couple of weeks ago. This was post June 15th where no one was masked, but this is when I trusted my vaccine and was unmasked for majority of the event. And then I have also been to other events where vac when I was around children or other youths and I just, just because they weren't vaccinated, I made sure that I kept my mask on. So it really depends on your surroundings, but I will share any information I do get and if I, any information I do learn about the mask mandate going forward with Michael and I'll let you know um, as soon as you hear about that as well. From Reverend Fred Harrell, Senior Pastor of City Church San Francisco, if we travel this summer to places where vaccination rates are low, should we wear masks indoors? Yes, yes, and yes. Um, if I were to travel this place to, and the vaccination rates were so low, I would definitely wear a mask. Even though the vaccines are highly effective and I have been vaccinated, I would wanna go the extra mile to just to be cautious to make sure that I get the extra protection. And I don't wanna get sick. I mean, I can still get sick by getting, um, by getting COVID, but at least I won't be as sick that I won't get hospitalized. The vaccine is going to keep you safe. So it's best if you wanna protect your vulnerable population, your kids at home, and you don't wanna bring it back to them. So it's best to continue wearing masks indoors, even, even if you're not traveling, even if you're just here or going to a local grocery store, you still wanna wear your mask just to protect your others and protect yourselves. From Rabbi Beth Singer, Senior Rabbi of Congregation Emmanuel. In one religious venue, the clergy were masked and the entire congregation was unmasked. In a different venue, the clergy were unmasked and the entire congregation was masked. What is the current best practice and how can we best sell or explain it to our congregants? So I would think about your congregation as a whole. You wanna make them feel welcome, them safe, and you wanna make them feel comfortable. But if you have children, you wanna be their role model by wearing a mask. So the best practice is to have everyone mask and treat everyone equitably. The unvaccinated should keep their mask on, but also wanna, they should always keep their mask on, but you wanna make it equitable for everyone that's at your congregation. So are they feeling comfortable with others being unmasked? Do they feel welcomed? I've also heard from some congregants that they're not attending in-person services because everyone is not masked, which is making them uncomfortable to attend in-person services. So do what you think is best for your congregants and, and make them feel comfortable, welcome and safe. And remind people that we do this to protect everyone, including our children and those who are unable to receive this gift of vaccination. Thank you, Havisa. Michael, wanna jump in with your questions before I go into those that came up in the chat? Really, and I, I wanna thank Hafisa for especially her last comment of being respectful of others. I was just looking at today's uh, front page of the San Francisco Chronicle and uh, the article talks about living in fear of the virus. Uh, people with weakened immune systems still staying away from crowds, worried that vaccines may not protect them. And, and I think that a lot of what you had to say today, Hafisa, was, was just around general respect, not only for yourself, but for those surrounding you. And so I think that, uh, you know, we don't want to shame people for wearing masks um, uh, and because in many cases they're doing it to protect others. So thank you very much. Uh, I guess one of the questions I had in just listening to your presentation, uh, and I wanna thank you for showing all of the different kinds of signage that was out there. I know that during the heart of the pandemic that you and John were getting signs out to all kinds of people. Uh, now that we're in this new phase with the, these, with the uh, new signage, uh, if I were a faith leader watching this today, I'd say, where do I get it? Um, and where do I get respirators or N95s? The, these are some practical questions and I'm, I'm hoping that you might be able to uh, give us some thoughts. I, we will of course uh, be sharing re the resources that you referred to today, but in terms of signage and, and, and the respirators, where do you get them? Yeah, so definitely. So the required signage by San Francisco, they are available online. So I will share those links with you, Michael. 
And as far as the respirator, it's interesting you mentioned that um, I attended a Cal OSHA training last week, and they had mentioned that because of this new change in the emergency temporary standards, California is now providing a one month free supply of respirators. So I will share that link with you as well. So it provides a list of um, partners that California has partnered with to provide those respirators. But again, these are just for voluntary use. So you could even take a poll for your with your undocumented employees saying, hey, if will you guys be needing a respirator? If they do not want one, then, then it's okay. But as long as you had asked them that they, then you, you should be fine um, with the Cal OSHA guidelines. And the signage? Uh so the signage again is on our website, um, on the DPH website, and I will share the link with you as well. But as you can see, the most of the ones that we did share, the one that I just shared earlier today, um, those were all made by the businesses. So you could create your own signs. Okay, thank you. That's very, very helpful. And 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 those signs that you shared as examples are will be on the recording link. Okay, I, I did have one other sort of a statement question. You, you made reference to the fact that because in response to an outbreak at the state house, that now all the legislators are mandated to wear uh, face masks. And I know that those who are unvaccinated now have to get tested twice a week, I think, uh, the legislators as well as the staff. In light of the state's guidances, uh, is this sending mixed messages? So, we're all part of a human experiment right now. You know, we're, we, we don't have answers to it. You know, like we saw the light at the end of the tunnel, but then like, there's like this pushback now. It's like, oh no, wait, everyone has to wear a mask again. So, I mean, the best thing right now, what to do is to get vaccinated. I think there were a total of nine people that tested positive out of the four, um, out, of, yeah, out of the nine or four that were fully vaccinated. So as you can see, even if you're vaccinated, you could still get the virus. You may not have symptoms, but you could still get the virus. So it's best to continue wearing masks while you're indoors, social distancing, just so that you add that extra protection and that you're keeping and respecting everyone that are around you. That's very, very helpful information. John, I'm gonna pass it back to you because I know you have a few more questions. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, we had a few come from the faith-based round table and Havisa, let me go into these. Uh, some churches have back-to-back -back celebrations. What do we need to do to clean between our services? Can we use missiles or other program handouts and songbooks? So currently there are no guidances that directly speak to cleaning requirements. However, just keep in mind that the spread of the disease does not seem to come from fomites. It's coming from the airborne transmission from an infected person but it's always a good safety measure to continue cleaning between or after services and to follow best practices to prevent transmission of the virus. So if you just do a basic wipe down using some cleaning agent or on high, surf, on high um, touch services, um, that should be fine. So something as simple as soap and water will do the job just as fine as well. You should mic uh, wipe your microphones, doors, pews, any, any common touch items, just clean those regularly um, and that should be fine. And if you're not doing any back-to-back -back services, then just wait a few days so the virus dies off. But the best practice right now is just to prevent the transmission is just to continue ventilation, masking and distancing. Thank you. Our houses of worship uh, are considered, or they're considering having a section for people who want to stay masked. Any thoughts on this, creating a, a master section? I, I think it's a wonderful idea, but just, you know your congregants well, so do what makes them feel comfortable and make it equitable. Instead of singling out individuals that are unvaccinated by keeping them, by keeping like a vaccinated and unvaccinated section, create a social distancing section instead for those wishing to distance themselves from others while also allowing people if they choose to, you know, sit close, closer to people that they haven't seen this whole pandemic. So um, I just wanna give an example of Glide. Um, they will be maintaining distance and keeping their mask on during services because they don't know who their attendees are. They have tourists attending and they don't know their vaccination status. So to make it safe, welcoming and comfortable for their attendees, they're gonna make it equitable for their congregants and ensuring them that they're not singling out by maintaining the distancing and masking. 
Havisa, from the some of the questions I'm seeing come into the chat, let me say, mm -hmm. may require a little research, but let me just sure. read through these. First of all, from Michael, and I'm sorry, I can't see the full name, Michael. Um, when I read the SFDPH guidance, it says we urge masking for those who are unvaccinated, urge masking. This presentation says it's required. Can you clarify? So the SFDPH, so I think so they were basically, you wanna look at, they're still following the state guidances. So, um, and based, so they want you to follow the state guidances. So you still need to look at what the state guidance says about individuals requiring a mask. So when what the state guidance says is that we are requiring it. So basically you're still required to wear it. It may be just the language that's being used in the guidances, but um, it is still required because we are currently following the state guidances on regarding mask masking. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I want to read these questions, and I'm not. You let me know if you think you can answer these. Uh, mm -hmm. At another, this comes from Lars Eric. Uh, at another briefing, it was somewhat unclear for how long um, the proof of vaccination status was to be maintained. I think Lars, you're talking about in a record. One statement was that you have to ask. It's not required to keep the records for a specific length of time. Any comments for how long you keep vaccination records? Um, I do not know the answer to that, but I can definitely find out to see yeah. um, what the requirement is for that. I think, Lars, one question, one aspect of this question is, is the difference between how long you maintain vaccination records for employees as compared to if you used to collect vaccination records for people that came into a place and we wanted to know who was vaccinated and unvaccinated. That timeline was three weeks. I remember that, but the, the reference that Havisa is making has to do with employee um, or employees, which could be volunteers, and those records are kept ongoing. They're not discarded. I think, I think that's the difference, but we'll still get around to researching that. Uh, and again, apologies for those who I can't read your full names uh, from Raphael. It is aligned with recent guidance to establish distinct protocols for kids less than 12, ineligible kids two to 12, and eligible adults. Is it aligned with recent guidance to establish distinct protocols for these age groups? So this age group, they're still unvaccinated. So right now, all we want to do is make sure that we're that they maintain masks and keep them physically distanced from others as much as we can when at least when outdoors and indoors as well. So um, it's best to say that yes, it is aligned just to keep sure that you know, just want to protect them. So do what you think is best for your child and those that are around you, um, for, especially for this age group. Okay, thank you. I, Michael, I think we still got some time, right? But we're, yes, we do. Good. And, and Lars, thank you for clarifying. Yes, uh, it has to do with employees. I think for those of you who are maintaining employee records, you'd add, it's, it's not clear where you put the employee record where you put this vaccination status, probably put in the employee record and it's just gonna live there as long as you have an employee record. Uh, we'll see where this goes. The um, we have third question, we want to eventually be able to unmask for our services. When will children's vaccines be available? And when can we expect everyone to be safe from COVID? So from what I last read, um, Pfizer announced early last month that it was moving to test its vaccine in ages, I believe it was five through 11, and that it'll begin testing the vaccine on infants as young as six months in late June. I'm not, I haven't read anything recent um, based on that, but they expect to see data for ages um, six months to two year olds to arrive in October through November. And then that's gonna be submitted for approval to FDA after that. So meaning, they should be available for six months to two year olds as early as next year. So for the five to 11 year old gap, we should probably expect them early fall, but the one six months to two year olds, that won't be until early next year. So even if vaccines are approved, it will still take time for our children to be fully vaccinated. And that may even mean maybe the summer of 2022 maybe a year from now. So we still have some a long time to go until, um, so we need to keep continuing to protect our children um, until we get the vaccinations approved for them. Regarding offices, all of, many of our houses of worship have 
more extensive operations than just our worship services. Regarding our offices, uh, I believe they are all allowed to reopen right now. What should be our masking protocols indoors if for offices and should we still maintain some social distancing? It never hurts um, to continue distancing and wearing a mask. Um, again, what, what makes it comfortable for your employees? If everyone is deciding to wear a mask, then hey, let them wear a mask. But if some people choose not to wear a mask, then don't, you know, don't retaliate it against them, you know, let them, that's your, that's their choice. But if you as an employer want to make sure that everyone continues to wear a mask and make sure you let that, you know, let your employees know that we are mandating masks. And you know, that is, that's completely fine because you are allowed to mandate mask requirements. Thank you. That is all the questions we have today. Thank you, John, and, and, and thank you, Hafisa. And I, I want to say to John and Hafisa, for the duration of the pandemic, uh, they have been incredible champions and advocates uh, for our communities of faith and faith leaders. Uh, they've been the ones I've gone to to get uh, responses when, when I've gotten questions and uh, needed clarifications of very complex health orders uh, and guidances and aggressive recommendations. Uh, Hafisa will continue to be uh, the city's liaison with the communities of faith. And so uh, we will, I'm sure we'll be seeing a lot more of you on these briefings uh, in, in, in the time to come. And John, uh, we thank you so much for all that you've done. I, I just have a few closing observations to make in the remaining time we have. Uh, as I mentioned, I, I want to commend our 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 faith leaders in San Francisco, because the overwhelming number of them are erring on the side of caution and, 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 and are mandating that masks continue to be uh, worn by those coming to worship. Uh, I, I guess the big message out there, there are a couple of big messages. One is one of respect. I, at the outset of the pandemic, I remember some people took it upon themselves uh, to sort of shame and chastise those who weren't wearing masks. Now that we have these new, uh, these new guidances, uh, I think that we need to be respectful of those who are wearing masks uh, and, and not to shame people because of their own uh, uh, preferences. And, and, and that came out very much in the presentation today. Uh, the other big uh, elephant in the room is get vaccinated um, because that, that seems to be the big issue. And, and uh, the San Francisco Interfaith Council will continue to be uh, advocating not only vaccination, but how to get vaccinated. And I just wanted to close with these words, um, very personal. Uh, my son got married a couple of weeks ago and his eminence Metropolitan Yerasim was uh, officiated at the wedding. And he gave some thoughts to the bride and groom. Uh, and, and he said, you know, we can just look at this, this last 16 months and think about what we have done and how we've changed our lives. Uh, and, and we've done it not only to take care of ourselves, but to care for those around us. And I think as people of faith, um, caring for those around us is, is just as important, if not more than caring for ourselves. And so I think that those who, uh, those who seek to continue wearing masks and those who could seek to continue to social distance and take precautions are doing it not only for themselves, but for those around them. And so with these closing words, um, we bring today's uh, program to a close. I would like to invite you all to join us next week, uh, uh, July 15th at 8.30 a.m. when a Senior Communications Manager for the San Francisco County Transportation Authority will brief faith leaders on the status of the downtown congestion pricing study. Uh, the San Francisco Interfaith Council hosted a number of focus groups uh, in areas impacted. Uh, and I, the, the, the topic might sound dry, but, um, but uh, this is talking about uh, in, you know, imposing some tolls in the future in certain uh, areas of the city where people will drive. Uh, and so it could impact our religious institutions and houses of worship. So I, I would encourage as many to join us as are possible. Again, we welcome those of our sisters and brothers from the Marin Interfaith Council who are with us today. And the invitation is open for you to join us again in the future. And a special thank you 
uh, to Scott Quinn, Reverend Scott Quinn, who is the executive director of the Marin Interfaith Council. That brings today's uh, program to a close. God bless you and God keep you.